Um, yeah, so I've I've called my talk real real time three D scene perception for robotics, and and really my uh, you know this this workshop's about three D vision and and robotics, and my view is that yes, three D vision is is essential for robotics, but more than just you know three D kind of single view vision and prediction, it's about three D scene representation. So I really think that that's how we're going to progress on robotics. We need to keep working hard on this problem of how to go from images and other perceptions that, are set, that, that, that a robot might get from its sensors and turning them into scene representations that we can then really use for robotics. So, I mean, that's something that I've believed going right back into my uh, career. So, um, yeah, as, as was mentioned in, in the in introduction, so I've spent a lot of my career working on visual slam. So this essential problem of cameras moving through the world, building maps of the scenes around them, and then doing localization relative to those maps. And that technology that, that uh, you know, I and others worked on going back to the 90s is now really present in a range of products, some of which you would definitely think of as robots, such as robot vacuum cleaners, like this one uh, from Dyson that I was personally uh, uh, involved in working on. Or, or drones like, like this one uh, uh, from DJI, but also a lot of other types of products like AR, VR headsets, like mobile phones that, that do um, localization and, and, and mapping. So if you can go from the sensors that these products have, and they're primarily uh, cameras, you know, fused with other things like inertial sensing and, and odometry, you can build a representation of the scene around those devices. And that enables intelligent action. So in the case of a, of a robot vacuum cleaner, for instance, it enables localization and therefore it enables precise, uh, you know, deterministic uh, cleaning. But I just think that's the basis that we need to just keep building on uh, for, for robotics and we'll be able to get further and further. Um, so, you know, one way to think about that uh, is, is that SLAM is evolving into something much bigger. And I've been using this term spatial AI recently to, to really represent what I mean, and maybe what I was always in, interested in by, by working on SLAM, that these ro robots and devices with sensors should, should be building a kind of picture, a representation of, of the world around them that enables intelligent action. And, and the SLAM systems that are out there in products already are, are relatively simple in terms of the representations they build. So the, the key, most important representation is a sparse map of landmarks that enables localization, but we're already seeing additional layers of capability being added into products like this. So dense scene mapping and also some capability for semantic understanding. Um, I just think we, we need to keep keep working on this and, and you know maybe these are not completely separate layers. Maybe, maybe they become much more intermingled, but that's the thing that will enable in, uh, yeah, an, an embodied device to really interact usefully with its uh, environment so the general kind of you know discussion around this kind of topic of spatial ai if you're if you're interested in reading more of my thinking about that i've got well a couple of papers called future mapping one and two in particular the, the first one uh, future mapping the computational structure of spatial ai systems really hones in on defining what a spatial ai system is and it has this hypothesis that to enable embodied ai a spatial AI system should build a persistent and understandable scene representation or world model, we, uh, which is close to metric 3D geometry, at least locally. So I think that the representations that these robots need to be really useful will at least locally be, be quite uh, metric. It is, it is in the end the most useful sort of representation of scenes. But how good does that representation need to be? How accurate does it need to be metrically? What other sorts of properties should that representation includes so it should certainly include semantic properties as well as just raw geometry and then the other thing i'm really interested in which i'll mention a little more at the end is you know what is the, what is the computational patterns in terms of storage and computation that will really enable this how can you make it efficient and how does that relate to the hardware that we'll actually use to, to implement these systems so another kind of discussion paper that i was involved in recently, which I think is, is very interesting to, to people thinking about 3D vision and robotics, is this one called Rearrangement, a challenge for embodied AI together with a really uh, in, interesting uh, set of uh, 
co-authors. Um, so this is really thinking about a general class of robot problems that I think we can hold out as, as targets at the moment for, for the sort of things we might expect robots to be capable of in the future that involve essentially rearranging scenes. So, you know, a really tough example of this might be a robot that could tidy up a kitchen, for, for instance. So it involves, in, in my mind, really understanding that scene in, in detail. And it's hard for me to, to imagine a robot that could tidy a kitchen without building a really kind of quite high quality, persistent, close to metric 3D representation of that space that it's always kind of moving around, localizing with respect to and updating as, as it makes changes to the scene uh, via manipulation. So I think we need these persistent, real-time updatable compositional scene representations. Okay, so having, having made that argument let, let's look into a bit of detail in, and in particular going through some some of the things we've done uh, in, in my lab over the last few years so how are we going to represent scenes in a way that's useful for robotics and I think this is very much still an, an open question so definitely there are various kind of well-known classical ways of representing detailed 3D geometry that I still think are very useful things to uh, to, to think about. So for instance, um, we had uh, some work, this is the, the system called Elastic Fusion uh, from 2015, which is a, a depth camera based uh, SLAM system that builds a dense 3D map of a scene using a circle representation. So if you zoom in close, you would see that this map is made up of millions of tiny little oriented disks. Uh, so it's a bit like a point cloud, but with a bit of extra uh, surface. Uh, in information. So that's a representation that can fairly efficiently represent the surface shape of a scene in a lot of detail. Uh, you know, other well-known representations would be, you know, meshes or volumetric grids of different types or occupancy grids or maybe sign distance function grids in, in methods like Connect Fusion. So very, very useful representations of geometry. We can also, you know, add semantic layers to representations like that. So some of the earliest work that we did in, in that direction was, was in the work called Semantic Fusion. So this was basically taking Elastic Fusion and then combining that with, uh, so a pre-trained off-the-shelf neural network that was able to label views with per pixel uh, semantic um, identities. And, and what we would do in Semantic Fusion was essentially just fuse those per frame labels into our 3D circle representation. And we were you know, therefore starting to get this 3D labeled scene. Um, but, you know, this, this worked well in, in some ways, but you can all already see, you know, also some of the problems. It was quite hard to do that consistently and, and accurately, but already we were, you know, doing better than single view uh, semantic labeling because we were fusing information from lots of uh, different views. Um, so, so thinking about the, this question of, of, of representation, of, of course, you know, what's happening recently is, is thinking more generally about neural representations of, of scenes. So having worked a lot on you know, real-time 3D uh, dense SLAM systems, once we heard about uh, this new style of representing 3D scenes via directly neural networks, so obviously in, in methods like uh, NERF, um, so this idea that you could train a, a, an MLP in quite a general way to represent uh, a scene, we immediately thought, well, could we actually make a real-time SLAM type of uh, system based on this MLP idea? Um, so this was the first work we did in that direction. So this system called IMAP, which was uh, published at uh, ICCV uh, 21. So let me just show you the, the video of this. So the setup here is very similar to what we might have had in Elastic Fusion or any, any number of other kind of SLAM systems we've worked on. So a real-time uh, camera being moved around in, in a room, um, and this is a, a depth camera, so it captures RGB and depth. But what we showed in, the, in this paper, so at the time when this work was first done, you know, NERF was something that was taking hours and hours uh, to train, you know, with pre-captured views, with, with camera estimation already done. Here we're doing all of that incrementally and online. So from the stream of RGB and depth views, so that's something that we did to make this easier than the NERF problem. We're using depth images as well. 
Uh, and the other thing that we do that's you know a bit different from how NERF normally runs is we're not trying to predict and render all of the pixels all the time. We're doing this uh, sampling. So what you can see at the bottom is as we're moving this camera around, we're choosing a certain subset of those frames as keyframes. And then at each point in time, we're choosing one of those keyframes. I'm just going to pause this for a second. So, so we'll choose one or, or a set of those keyframes and then a set of points within those keyframes to actually try and train our model. So what, what our model of the scene is, is, is just an, an MLP um, network. It's actually a really small uh, uh, M MLP, only about a, a megabyte of, of weights. And it is in this kind of uh, coordinate style like, like NERF. So this is an MLP where you feed in a coordinate X, Y, Z, and it will output the, the, the estimated color of, of that point in space uh, and also the, the occupancy of the density of that point in space. So to train this network, we render views from it, from lots of, uh, fr from, from the positions from which we've got captured our keyframes. So we render a set of points here. Uh, th so these are the RGB and depth frames we've captured at a particular keyframe. This is what our network is currently rendering from that position. And then at each of these points, we, we you know, calculate the difference between the actual captured values and what we're currently rendering. And then of course, propagate that loss back through to update the network such that if this is all working perfectly, you know, this should look exactly like this and this should look exactly like this. But we showed that you could really do that in incrementally. So you start with just one frame, you start training the network, then you gradually add more frames, you continuously train, and this model just gradually converges to something that looks like convincing 3D geometry. So let's keep this running a little bit longer. So this has been running in real time for, uh, I think, three or four minutes, you know, while we're actually moving the camera around, we're still adding uh, extra frames you'll see that the camera kind of might go over to look more closely at this part of the scene, which is a, you know, like a table with some objects on it. We capture some more detailed views of that part of the scene, and therefore we get more accurate scene reconstruction of, of the objects on the table. Um, and, and then we're also, you know, doing camera tracking to camera pose estimation within the same framework here. So that's not a separate thing that's also done within the, the same uh, optimization. So I think we're close to the kind of end of the real time run here. So let me just skip forward here and we can see the kind of some different uh, projections of, of the 3D scene that we have reconstructed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in this question of is this a good representation of 3D scenes that's useful for robotics? So in my mind, you know, we were very much comparing this with, for instance, what we might have done with Elastic Fusion or Connect Fusion. Um, so some of the properties you'll notice is this is not at the moment a super accurate reconstruction. It looks fairly sort of low resolution. Um, and that's mostly because we've used a small MLP and we were kind of forced to do that by wanting to train this, uh, you know, fast and, and in real time. But on the other hand, it has some really nice uh, properties. So it's very kind of smooth and continuous and kind of coherent. Uh, and in fact, you know, that were, those were some of the properties that we found really, really interesting. So I'm just going to skip this back a little bit and play it. So one of the things you'll notice is the whole thing seems to sort of vibrate. And that's because we're continuously training this, you know, this stochastic gradient descent going on through the, through the weights here and everything is changing a little bit. But some of the aspects of that re reveal that there's this sort of automatic compression going on. So for instance, look at this, this orange thing here is a football that's on the floor and you can see that its shape is kind of uh, you know oscillating but interestingly it's not like you know random noise on the surface of that thing it's like the whole shape of the football you know gets bigger or smaller in in kind of quite coherent ways so in my mind what that really reveals is that within this megabyte of weights that are representing this scene there's probably a pretty small number of those weights that are associated with the shape of that football. So somehow the network has found a way to apply these weights that it has in an efficient way to represent this scene. So what that really means is there's a lot of kind of co coherence. So, so the nearby, uh, nearby elements of this object here 
are reconstructed, you know, by this same small set of weights within the network. That's that's the sort of automatic kind of decomposition and compression that, that has happened of the scene. So that's very different, for instance, from something like a point cloud or, or a mesh. It doesn't have any of those uh, properties. So in terms of how this might be useful for robotics, those were the sort of properties that we uh, pursued. And in particular, when in the next step of this kind of work, we started trying to add semantics to these uh, representations. So we had this paper called Semantic Nerf, which I think was with the was the first paper, sort of adding semantic properties into these MLP uh, representations in, in, in a general way. But I'll show you this one, which is uh, I label. So this is a real time interactive, uh, you know, semantic MLP representation of a scene. So I'm going to show you exactly the same kind of scene that, that we just uh, looked at here. It's a room scene. Um, and we're running very much the same thing as we did in, in IMAP. So we're feeding in RGB and, and depth uh, images, and we're trying to reconstruct the, the, the uh, you know, the 3D occupancy and the color of, of the scene. But now we slightly modify our network to have some extra outputs. And th these, these are just like, uh, so 10 extra outputs from the network uh, that we interpret as, as a kind of vector of indicators of what is the semantic class of any particular point in the scene. And, and, in, and what's really interesting is we don't really have to predefine what those mean. So initially we've just got 10 semantic outputs here. And all that we're rendering in this view at the moment is which of those outputs fires highest at any particular point in the scene. And initially that's just kind of nonsense. It just, you know, will we'll show some kind of messy color map here. But interestingly, this is already a somewhat coherent looking color map. So it's not just a random cloud of points. Again, because of this kind of coherence property and because these outputs are being generated by the same small network that's generating uh, you know, density and color, they kind of inherit those coherence properties. So they tend to latch themselves onto object-like things, even when you haven't given them any, any kind of extra information. But what we show here now is, is now what we can do is add a tiny, tiny amount of uh, supervision to this. So this is a system that's never had any semantic pre-training at all, or it's never in fact seen any other data other than these live frames of this view. But what we're going to do is now apply a little bit of human labeling here. So we apply some clicks uh, to the scene. So what we do here is we click these points here. And for each of the clicks that we point, we, uh, we, we make, we say, you know, this at uh, this click here, you know, the green label should be highest. And here we just type in a word and, and give the green label the name ball. And then we add a few blue clicks here and we define this shelves uh, class. And then we add a few clicks here and call this the bed class. But what you can see is even though we've only added a very small number of clicks, these kind of labels spread into the coherent uh, kind of object-like regions in the scene that have been discovered by this kind of automatic decomposition that has happened just by making an MLP fit this scene. So the result of keeping doing this is that we can label the semantics of this whole scene by making only, a, I think it's 140 clicks within the whole scene, and we can get really kind of accurate uh, semantic labeling of, of the whole scene with this incredibly efficient human interaction. So that, that's very interesting, but you might think, okay, but you need a human in the loop here uh, still to add the, these labels. Um, so, so the kind of next thing that we did was think, well, what if a robot was actually kind of making its own clicks? So this paper that we presented at uh, Coral uh, at, at the end of, of last year is essentially the same system, but here we call it an autonomous robot experimenter. So we're running this iLabel network. Um, so here's a robot arm. It's got a, a depth camera attached to it here. And the, the, as the arm moves around, we're going to capture some, some views of the scene. But now instead of kind of a human clicking to add labels, the robot is going to go down and make some sparse interactions with the scene. So what it did there was it went down and kind of poked the scene. And what it's trying to do is to classify this scene into hard and soft. So whenever it pokes the scene, it can use a little bit of force feedback 
to determine whether the thing that it poked is hard or soft. So here it poked this kind of cushion here with a cat on it, and this, this is soft. So it added a soft label over here. Uh, and it's just going to keep doing that. So, so the places that it touches are guided by the entropy of the current label map that you can see visualized down in the bottom left here. So it's going to try and make touches where it's least able to predict the hardness or, or softness of the scene. And you'll see that each time it makes a touch, it gets another observation of either hard or soft. And then it keeps predicting this hardness or softness property for the whole scene. And you'll see that after very few touches, this converges to something really quite accurate. So we've now got this sort of segmentation of the scene into hard and soft things. So let me show you just one more slightly uh, different version of that. So this is now what we have a different sort of interaction where the, the, the sensor that we're using is not touching, but we have a, a just a, a small spectrometer sensor here. So this is just a sensor that shines some infrared light of different colors onto the scene, looks at the amount of reflection of the different colors, and then based on a simple classifier can determine whether it's most likely that the, the, the material that it touched is wool, cotton, synthetic, or, or, or the table. Um, and, and so now you'll see that it starts making touches on the scene and on an each touch here, it says, okay, that was wool, that was cotton, uh, that was also cotton. So with no prior information, it's, it now just knows that it's good to group the, the things that are coherent in the neural map together. So again, with very few interactions, we're now getting this quite high quality segmentation of, of the scene with no prior information uh, at all. Um, okay, so this is a slightly kind of artificial example in, in a way, you know, it's a real robot, it's real objects, but it's a kind of simplified setup. But we think this is very promising to, to show that how the, these, that, you know, what we think the interesting property of these neural representations are that might be interesting to robotics, this natural kind of coherency, and you might not need super accurate geometry for the things that a robot would, would do with with this scene. Um, okay, so, so that was um, if you didn't have any kind of prior information. So one of the latest thing, things we've done on this line of neural field uh, work is what if you do have some pre-trained network? Um, so this is, uh, you know, similar to some things that, uh, you know, several other groups have done, uh, but we've, we've done it in, in a real-time uh, system here. So very similar to iLabel. So this is saying I've got a neural field that instead of trying to render color from the scene, it's trying to render some general uh, kind of feature maps. So instead of trying to train this against color images, we will take every image that comes uh, uh, from the camera and send it through some pre-trained network. So this could be, uh, you know, the early feature maps of a CNN, or it could be something, you know, more sophisticated like dino features or, or something. But essentially it will turn every image into a feature maps. And then when you render from your neural field representation, you also try and render feature maps and then you train your network so that it's rendering feature maps that match up with the features that you're actually measuring from your camera. So this com compared to the, the previous demos definitely gives a more sort of, uh, you know, a, a grouping of similar things in the scene uh, which just comes from the feature maps. And that can, is then in addition to this kind of natural coherence and grouping that comes from, from the neural field. So that in some ways gives a more powerful system. Yeah, but it does require this pre-trained uh, network. But on the other hand, we think that these sort of feature generating networks are very, very uh, general and useful for all sorts of uh, different tasks. Um, so what I've shown you so far are systems that are trying to make representations of whole scenes. I think that the other kind of key uh, approach in particular for, uh, you know, representing scenes in ways that are useful to, to robots are to directly decompose the representations of scenes at the level of objects. So to, to explicitly have object level representations. And th this is something we've also worked on quite a lot. I think the key question here, if you're trying to make object representations of scenes, is how much prior information do you have? And I think that is a sliding scale from, 
you know, some objects you'll have really strong prior information. So, so this system, for instance, so we've had a couple of papers along this line. There's one called More Fusion. And the one I'll quickly show you a video from here is called uh, Reorient Bot, uh, published last year. So here we're assuming that we do have strong prior knowledge in the form of CAD models. So we know, uh, you know, precise 3D models of the set of objects that we expect to see in this scene. So that doesn't mean this is an easy problem, because if we come up to a cluttered scene, this problem of, of accurately fitting the 3D models of those objects and essentially going from this real scene to this kind of digital twin that you can see on the right, that's still a, a, a tricky problem because the objects might be, you know, occluded and lying on top of each other and that kind of thing. But if you can do that, it gives you an, you're in an incredible pow incredibly powerful position for manipulation. So here the robot was tidying up that scene in a very kind of general way, dealing with these cluttered objects, even doing things like re-grasping them if it needed to, to be able to place them accurately. So if you really understand the 3D uh, shape of objects well, you can do more than just pick them up and drop them. You can pick them up and place them uh, very precisely in a scene, which is exactly what a robot that needs to tidy up scenes would have to do. This work is, is a, a, a slightly looser uh, uh, situation of prior knowledge. So this is called Node Slam. So what if you don't have precise CAD models for objects, but for each of a different class of object, you have a sort of flexible shape model. So in this system, for four different types of objects, so cans, bottles, uh, mugs, and bowls, we've pre-trained a, a 3D shape model. Um, so that means that at runtime, we can detect the classes of the objects, and then for each one, we bring in the appropriate shape model and we optimize this, the, 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 a low dimensional shape code that, that gives us the precise uh, shape of, of an object. Uh, so again, we've got a robotics uh, example here. Um, so we want to, uh, sorry, I'm in the right place. So we want to tidy up these uh, objects and put them away neatly into this uh, box here so the camera makes a couple of observations of the scene we fit these uh, object models so in the top left again here you can see this kind of digital twin representation and you'll see that you know we don't just estimate the rough positions of these objects we estimate their position and and shape and size really accurately and that means that we can do precise manipulation with them so here what we're doing is we're picking up the bowls one by one and we're going to neatly, you know, stack them in the corner of this box. So the kind of grasping stuff here is just some off-the-shelf path planning. The, you know, the grasping stuff is easy once you've solved the uh, uh, perception here. And these are objects that it's never it's never seen these precise objects uh, before, but it's seen a data set of mugs, uh, you know, which are, you know, span the space of, of, of the general shape of mugs, for instance. Um, now, of course, still there will be objects that you don't know about in, in advance. So the most kind of recent work um, that we've done along, along this line, and in fact, this is going to be presented uh, by, by my PhD student, Shin Kong, here at, here at CVPR, um, is the idea that you might have no specific prior information about objects, but you're going to make a separate neural field model of, e of each one. So what we do in, in this system called VMAP is... We're using the same kind of method as, as, as IMAP in that we're going to use a neural field to represent 3D shape, and we're going to run that in, in real time. But rather than having one single neural field to represent the whole scene, we're going to seg pre-segment the scene into objects, and we're going to have a separate neural field representation of each object. So here you can see that as the camera is exploring around the scene, we're gradually building up this database of objects, which we're incrementally uh, reconstructing. So now each one of these objects has these nice kind of coherence and completion properties because it's modeled uh, by a, a neural field. And, and, and you know, one of the uh, cool things in this paper is, is to you know, train all of those neural fields. So we might have you know, 20 different objects represented at the same time and we're training, therefore, 20 neural fields in, in parallel by this vectorized um, uh, training method so that they can all happen in real time. Okay, 
Um, so just to kind of get towards the end, the end of the talk. So we've talked a lot about spatial, uh, you know, representation. Another kind of key interest of mine at the moment is how that relates to computation hardware and this idea that you know CPUs and GPUs that were, that are the things we use a lot at the moment are just the starting point of I think you know a huge explosion and diversification of the type of processes that we're going to use uh, for spatial AI in in the future. And an example is something like the IPU. Uh, from, from from GraphCore, so this is a company in the UK, massively parallel chip, but with a really more general type of parallelism than, than a GPU. So one of the things I discuss in the future mapping paper is in order to make spatial AI really you know, efficient in the future, we need to really think about the graph structures in the algorithms that we're designing and in the data stores that they have, and as far as possible, try to map those down onto the computation hardware that we're going to be using, because the key to efficiency is to avoid moving data around. So if we can kind of really co-locate processing and storage on graph-like computing hardware, that will really be the way forward. And in my mind, what we're going to ha you know, have to come back to and what will still be crucial in all of this is probabilistic inference. So that's what I've really learned over the years in SLAM. It's the only thing that really works. If you want to do things like long-term incremental mapping, you know, loop closure, you want to continuously learn. So, you know, some of the kind of things that are currently limitations in systems like IMAP that we want to continually train this uh, neural representation of a scene. But in order that we don't kind of forget about things that it knows about and has seen in the past, we have to keep kind of showing it old data. We have to have this kind of replay method of continual learning. And that's not really going to be scalable. So I really think we have to get to something much more probabilistic where the representations we're using for 3D are intrinsically representing uncertainty. So what, what I'm really thinking about a lot at the moment is going back to you know, factor graphs and, and traditional graph-like representations of scenes and how to make those really general. So one last paper that I'll, I'll show you, which is also going to be uh, presented in this conference uh, at CVPR by Eric's, Eric Dexheimer. And also he's going to be doing a live demo of this in, in the demo session, so definitely see that, is some of our latest work on, on probabilistic uh, SLAM. And in particular, this uses a, a, a neural network. Uh, and so we're, we're all very interested in how to use learning together with probabilistic information in SLAM. Um, but what is the right thing to ask that neural network to do? So you can feed an RGB image into a network and tell it to predict depth. That works reasonably well. But how, if you've got depth predictions for many frames, how do you actually combine that into a 3D representation? How do you take account of the uncertainty in that depth? That's a difficult thing to do. So in this work, we do something a bit different. What we ask our neural network to do is to predict depth covariance. So this means for any subset of points in, in an image, uh, what our network will tell us is how similar it thinks the depths of those points will be. So here's just a bit of visualization where we look at some different points in the scene and, and the network will tell us. So here, for instance, this point on the floor here, the network is telling us by, via this heat map here, how correlated it thinks the depth of this point should be to other depths of other points in the scene. So clearly this whole kind of floor region here is coherent with this point here. It should have similar depths where it's not very likely to have similar depths to these other objects. So what we do in this paper is we, is we build that into a full kind of monocular real-time dense SLAM system. So this is a, a kind of keyframe-based dense SLAM system that uses multi-view optimization together with this per-frame depth covariance prior to give us this kind of real-time uh, you know, 3D scene reconstruction, which is really good, for instance, at even picking up you know, small detailed objects like uh, you know, cables and, and the you know, the legs and wheels of, of, the, of this chair. So definitely go and uh, see uh, Eric's uh, paper and uh, demo. So more generally, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, incremental graph-like estimation and in future mapping too, and especially I talk a lot about Gaussian belief propagation as a general probabilistic framework that I think has the right properties that we need. And if you're more interested in this, I, I would point you to this it's called a visual introduction to Ga Gaussian belief propagation. It's an online interactive article that talks a lot more about that. 
Okay, so I think my time's nearly up, so I'll, I'll just con conclude. So spatial AI research is exciting. I think we're still going to be doing it uh, for a long time yet. So one of the things I've focused on on this talk is these kind of special properties of neural field representations of scenes that I think could be useful for robotics. Even, even if they're small MLPs, they don't necessarily give us really precise reconstruction, but they have these com compression and coherence and completion properties that I think could be really interesting for robotics. And maybe we'll see a kind of forking between those sorts of small representations that might be good for robotics and manipulation versus, for instance, you know, high resolution, you know, NERF style photo, photometric, photorealistic reconstructions. There are definitely good applications for those things, but I'm not sure you need that for robotics. And just to mention my, my affiliation, so I'm leading the academic lab, the Dyson Robotics Lab at Imperial College, where we collaborate with, with Dyson on scene understanding and manipulation. Uh, and I'm also co-founder of Slamcore, which is a London-based startup. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davidson, for the presentation. And do you have any questions inside? Uh, can you just go to the yeah, go to the mic so that everyone can hear you? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm quite curious, what device are you using for the IMAP and the uh, iLabel? What device? Yeah, like GPU for training or CPU. Um, so, so I mean, this was a couple of years ago now, but it, it was a, a fairly standard um, desktop uh, GPU, uh, the, the paper will certainly give details. I, I can't remember exactly which uh, GPU it was, but um, yeah, uh, uh, a, a single uh, a single GPU. Yeah, just oh. a desktop desktop st uh, style. Yeah, and then we're using okay. a, you know, an RGBD uh, camera. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, so actually, uh, I have a question. So regarding the I map and uh, sorry, I label. So, uh, when you uh, the the reason of using the simply representation is kind of because it's coherence or continuity, and uh, but like uh, for like three D representation, I can see that because like the input uh, input modality is directly that's directly implicit. Uh, I mean, explicitly encodes the geometry. But for like semantics, for example, a, fl a flat surface with multiple, the, you can have like multiple semantics. So how, how can it, uh, how can this uh, like coherence property of this uh, implicit neural representation be adapted to this, this interleaving like semantics, sometimes uh, some like type of this kind of data, how, how is it possible to do that? Um, so of, of, of course the, the MLP is generating color as, as well as uh, shape. So it, you know, if there's coherence in in the color of the of the scene, that that's something which it should also uh, take account of. Um, but but you're right that those properties might not be so strong on you know just truly planar scenes, for instance, with complicated patterns and 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 so on. That's where I think pro probably this idea, of, uh, like in the feature fusion work that I I showed, you'll get those properties more strongly if you're sending your images through some you know prior network that's turning it into a feature representation where i think that sort of you know kind of those will also give you good cues to, to segment the scene in, into different uh, objects that's it thank you so do you have any other question oh yeah what uh, thank you so much for the impressive impressive talk and uh uh, as you mentioned, the visual rearrangement task actually motivates a lot of those uh, advanced like scene representations, for example, the compositional properties like the, the completeness. So, but if we look at look back to the task, so do you, from your view, do you think this visual rearrangement is really a must have functionality like for robotics uh, in the future? Uh, well, yes, de definitely. So, you know, in, in that paper, we discuss rearrangement as a really kind of general kind of catch-all problem that I think describes all, all sorts of, you know, tidying tasks, maybe also things like construction tasks, you know, for instance, taking a set of blocks and building a tower, you could think of as a, as a rearrangement uh, task. So I, I, I really think it's a very good Kind of description of, of a wide uh, you know class of problems that I think are are essential if we want robots to do useful things. So you know my main kind of 
interest application wise working with with dyson is home robotics and we're really trying to think of you know what would be useful robots for the home so yeah people i i think would really value a robot that could tidy up a, a scene you know so for instance you've finished dinner and the robot could come and take all those objects and tidy them away and put them where they're meant to be so when when i talk about rearrangement it's that sort of task it's taking a, a scene where uh yeah which is a sort of object level scene and yeah t taking the objects from starting positions to to goal positions okay thank you so much for the uh, for, for sharing uh all right uh i guess I'll, oh yeah yeah just one more question yeah just the last question thank you andrew for a very interesting uh um presentation uh, my question is about vmap uh, maybe uh, if you could uh, explain a little bit. Uh, I'm interested in terms of the reconstruction of the individual uh, object in, in the scene um, for different uh, neural, um, you use different neural network for different objects. Uh, do you look into the uh, the, uh, the same object class, like for the, the same chair, but the, um, there, there are multiple instances mm -hmm. in the scene and um, you can create a, a, a more complete, um, 3D reconstruction of the chair from different view of different chairs and uh, maybe some uh, observation about how you uh, pass the images of individual segmentation. Does the error from the segmentation affect the reconstruction geometry of the individual instances? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point. I mean, that's something that we're not doing at the moment in 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 that paper so we really do build a separate reconstruction of each object and there's no kind of sharing so if there were multiple instances of the same type of object at the moment those would be separately uh reconstructed so yeah of course it makes a lot of sense that if you can identify that these are the same objects you should use you know all of the data to contribute to both of, of the models and make a kind of unified model but there there i would say it becomes a little tricky with regard to yeah how, again this whole question of how much prior information do you, do you have so i mean if you had good prior knowledge of those objects to start with i'm not sure that you want would want to do this vmap style thing of just bottom up reconstruction you i would think you might want to do something more like you know the model fitting uh, type of approach and you you would uh, identify the relative pose of those objects and and fit fit the same uh, model to them with slightly different pose but but yeah in, in general this question of how to how to reconstruct an uh you know pretty unknown objects i think is still a really open and difficult question so thanks <laughs>